Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of STEM Girls Virtual. My name is Emily and I'm here on behalf of Cincinnati Museum Center. On this show, we talk about different careers in the STEM fields. Those fields being science, technology, engineering, and math. Today is an extra special STEM Girls because we have If Then Ambassador, Paleontologist, and Fossil Preparator, Miria Perez of the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share with you what I get to do every day. Yeah, and we're excited to have you. And again, you have a really cool job. You're a paleontologist um, and you also get to prepare fossils. So can you tell us how you became interested in paleontology? Sure. So I think like most kids, I had what was called fossil fever and I never really got rid of it. I was obsessed with dinosaurs and paleontology ever since I was a really small girl, probably about two years old. And my mom would take me to the Houston Museum of Natural Science, um, our local museum. And I'd spend hours in the paleontology hall looking at the dinosaurs. And I would drag my friends along and we'd have to go see the dinosaurs the first and the last um, time we went to the museum, of course. And later when I was 12, I went to this event to meet a, a curator, a paleontologist at the Houston Museum. And I asked about volunteering. And somehow they let 12 year old me start volunteering as long as I had a parent around. And that's where I learned how to prep fossils, give exhibit tours, and also even go on excavations. That's cool. Not every teenager gets to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so what are your, you've touched on it a little bit, but what are your duties and responsibilities as a paleontologist and when you're preparing fossils? Sure. So my duty as a fossil preparator is to break away the rock from the fossil. And that can be tricky sometimes, uh, but we use a variety of tools. We use things like air scribes, which are like mini jackhammers, which I'll show you later. And we use dental picks. And, and the coolest tool I think I've worked with was a porcupine quill, because that's able to help you remove kind of sandy rock away from the fossil. Yeah. And also, yeah, it's so, it's so much fun. Another thing we get to do is make copies um, for molding and casting. So we make copies of original fossils and that can get pretty messy and a lot of fun. And then we also make what's called a jacket, which is kind of like if you break your bone and they do a cast and it's the white stuff that hardens. Mm. We make something very similar to that to um, cover the bone, especially when it's in the field and bring it back. Oh, wow. So a lot of different things. It definitely keeps you busy, it sounds like. Um, that's really neat. And you're, you're in the paleo lab at the Perel Museum right now. I am. Yes, that is so neat. Yes, and behind you is a decal of a dinosaur that looks very realistic. Um, but yeah, so this is awesome. So this is where you work when you're, when you're at the museum. This is kind of your office. Yeah, this is pretty much our office. We actually have two labs. This is the one that you can come see that's visible to the public. So I'm behind glass here. Uh yeah. So everybody can come in and take a look and see what our current projects are. Nice. And so can you show us some things since you're in the lab? Of course. Yeah, I'll go ahead and give you like a little tour if you guys want. Sure. Yes, we'd love to. So a lot of our fossils in this lab right now are from northern Alaska and it's Cretaceous. So it's about 70 million years old. Wow. And this is from a dinosaur, and most of the stuff we have in here is from a dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus proorum. And I'll go ahead, let me go ahead and show you a picture of the dinosaur first before sure. I start um, showing you different bones so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Oh, so wow. this is the animal, and it's a relative of Triceratops. Okay. And you can see that this guy has, oops, instead of, I've got little chunks of bone falling out here. Let me go ahead and fix that. <laughs> stuff happens so all these little bones will eventually go back together but this is pachyrhinosaurus and instead of those three horns like triceratops it's got this big kind of nasty looking thing right here that's called the nasal boss okay. and in life it would actually be covered in a really thick skin pad um, maybe to butt heads or maybe to show off but a lot of our fossils come from this animal and we even have it on display out there so oh, very neat. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Oh, cool. So this is what um, something looks like when it comes back from the field from Alaska. 
And what's really cool about all of these is they had to be helicoptered in because they're in such a remote location. Oh, wow. Um, but this is that jacket that I was talking about earlier that kind of protects the fossil. And unlike Jurassic Park, where you have you know, people working on a skeleton outside, like in detail, mm -hmm. brushing them, that actually happens in the lab most of the time because you want to be able to work with, you know, mic um, under magnification so you can see what you're doing, make sure you right. don't damage bone. So yeah. that's a little bit of bone peeking up there. Oh, so, so I'm not cool. sure what this is. The rest of that is the matrix of the rock around the bone. And all these little marks here are scribe marks. And I can get the tool running if you want to hear what that sounds like as well. Sure. Um, so yeah, this is what it looks like. It takes you know, a couple months to, you know, sometimes weeks if you have something that's you know, pretty easy to prep. It all depends on the rock. And so mm -hmm. I'll take you over to our tool cabinet. Let's sure. go ahead and pick out, a, pick out a scribe here. You got just like a regular tool toolbox there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got all kinds of stuff in here. We have pliers, scissors. We even have saws when we have to break open that um, jacket. So mm -hmm. we have to use some saws, sometimes power tools to open it up because it's pretty thick. Oh, wow. Let's go ahead. Let's pick our weapon here. Um, sure. I want not that. That almost looks like um, dental tools. Kind of. I mean, yeah. Really, those would be really intense dental tools, but they kind of <laughs> look a little bit like that. It'll sound like one, too, when I get it started. Okay. So let's go yeah, ahead and this plug is in. So, so cool. All right, I'm going to have to set you down just a moment. I'll let you look sure. up, Kathy. Oh, no problem. So here's one of our scribes. Okay. And this guy um, is what we call the 9100. There's a bunch of different kinds of tools, but pretty much you've got pressurized air coming through this tube. Mm -hmm. And then inside here, it vibrates that needle, and that needle is able to, to prep away the rock. So let's see how I'm going to do oh, this. Let me set you down again. <laughs> okay. So yeah. we're just going to work, work away slowly. Can you just let me know whenever you want me to stop or if you Oh, want sure. To... I think that's great. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it, it looks more exciting when it's under the magnification because <laughs> you look like you're doing more work there. Right. <laughs> I can see, since that's so finely detailed, I can see why it would take weeks and weeks sometimes to, to get something done since it's so finely detailed. It certainly takes a long time, but you get stuff like this at the end, which is really cool. Yeah, um, that's amazing. This is actually a lower jaw, what we call the denary of Pachyrhinosaurus. This is a finished project. Mm -hmm. And you've got all of these little tooth sockets right here. Yeah, <laughs> so you can see that it was an herbivore. Yeah, this guy was herbivorous. And all the teeth are gone, unfortunately. The teeth fall out a lot. <laughs> yeah, now I can see that. Oh, that's so neat. Okay, so I just have to ask, what is it like, what's the feeling that you get when you uncover something that has been in the earth for like 70 million years? Can, can you describe that for us? Yeah, it's honestly really exciting because you are the first person to see that fossil for 70 million years or however yeah. old it is. You know, that's that fossil seeing the light of day for the first time in forever. And that's really exciting because you know, you are an adventurer in that. You're discovering something new as you prep. And even though some may say it's tedious, I think it's really therapeutic. Um, you're going through and you're slowly uncovering and you're, you're chipping away rock and you're reading the, the bones and the fossils and the rock as well. And that is just really exciting in itself. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I have to imagine that's a really neat feeling and you're part of that fossils story then. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. And then um, another question, uh, kind of a little bit of a flip. What are some challenges you face uh, in being a paleontologist? Sure. So um, when I do fossil prep, I actually started this job not knowing how to prep dinosaur fossils. Um, the rock is very different and I'll flip around and show you. Sure. So this is actually something um, from the time after the dinosaurs. This is mammal um, bone okay. right here and that's really light colored. Yeah. And then you have stuff 
from Alaska and it's this chocolate brown color mm -hmm. and the rock is this little gray um, color here and it's very different and so you have to learn with each project or something from a different site um, what where we call areas where fossils are found mm -hmm. um, how to prep um, so something like that mammal fossil you might use a dental pick or mm -hmm. even a porcupine to scrape away that you have to learn different techniques and then something like a dinosaur bone from Alaska has really hard rock, very dense rocks. So we have to use that little jackhammer. Yeah. Um, and that's a totally different skill set. So coming into this job back in October of, oh my goodness, 2018, I think. So it's been a couple of years. I had to kind of learn how to use the air scribe with mm -hmm. this particular fossil. And so that, that has been challenging. Um, but you kind of use the same tools. You look for color, texture, and shape. And pretty soon you'll get the hang of it and learn how to do different fossils. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think sometimes when people hear challenges, they hear problems, and it's it's not necessarily. It's you know, challenges is what keeps you alert and uh, excited to do your job. So that's why I always like asking that question: is it's not, you know, what are the problems? It's like what challenges do you face in order to do your job? And it sounds like you know you you had to learn pretty quickly when when you started your role so yeah yes and with fossil prep you are creativity definitely helps if you're a creative person then you can definitely be a fossil preparator because sometimes the bones are shaped different and you know things are weird so if you want to make molding and casting or jackets you got to figure out different ways that may have not been done before mm -hmm. um, and kind of figure it out yeah no, that's awesome. So the flip side of the challenges is what are some of your favorite things about being a paleontologist? I absolutely love the variety. I mean, from prep, I get to guide volunteers and teach them how to prep, which I absolutely love. And then I have field work, so the variety is amazing. Um, another big thing is being a, a preparator means a bit of art and science. You have to use your hands a lot, and sometimes we have to make you no know, color decisions if we're making a cast and painting. And so we get a little bit of art mixed in there too. Yeah. And my two favorite classes growing up have always been art and science. And so I feel like I'm just in that perfect little, um, yeah. you know, combination there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people think art doesn't go with science or science doesn't go with art. And I think they do. I think you have to be very creative as a scientist and art is all about being creative. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the way we were connected is that you're an If Then ambassador. So can you kind of tell us what If Then is and what your role is as an ambassador? Sure. So I am very honored to be one of 125 women in STEM professionals. And what's super cool about this is we get to become role models for girls, especially, especially middle school girls, which was the age I actually got to start volunteering. So it feels like kind of this the circle. I was the apprentice, apprentice for so long and now I'm finally able to give back. And so I'm able to share, you know, the hardships that, that it takes to go through to become a STEM major and work in the STEM field to all of the rewards and, and how amazing it is to follow something that you really love. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And um, again, you're in Texas, we're in Cincinnati, Ohio. So we are able to still be connected and learn about the work you're doing. And um, this is gonna air the day after Fossil Day. So, um, you know, how timely. So that's, but it's really neat um, to get to be able to still talk and work with you so far away. Yeah, in a way the pandemic has almost made this ambassadorship more connected in a way because more people are doing online and virtual talks. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like without that, we may have not had this many connections virtually yeah. I'm not sure but yeah this program is normally done in person but since uh, March we've been doing it virtually and that has allowed us to get to be connected with people um, further away than than Cincinnati so in a way um, that's been that's been nice to to get to talk with uh, with people further away um, all the Ipman ambassadors we've interviewed you're the closest everyone else is in California or Oregon um, so yeah, this is, wow. <laughs> yeah, this has been great. Um, so you have a day that sticks out as like your best day as being a scientist or like a really memorable moment you've had. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. So it happens so often, so frequently in this job because we're constantly making discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, another thing about being a preparator, sometimes we actually go out in the field mm -hmm. and dig stuff. And so locally, uh, last year, we got called in to collect this turtle. Um, just the, the rear end of the turtle, so you had two little hind feet and the tail. Um, so we got to go out, and I love being outside to go out there and collect and do some field work. And that to me is some of my favorite stuff. And so that was a really cool moment, um, you know, scribing away and find, you know, working on a really cool bone that has interesting features and talking with the curators about, oh, this is where this blood vessel is, or this is where the nerves would be. That, like kind of learning more anatomy and as you're doing it is always exciting. So yeah. I think it happens a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it's awesome to, to meet someone who loves their job so, so much, you know, um, very lucky. But yeah, that's, again, I would imagine in the work you do, there's probably a lot of memorable moments. So that's great. Yes. Yeah. Um, you probably get this question a lot, but I am going to ask it. Do you have a favorite dinosaur? And if so, why? Yeah, it definitely changes for me um, sure. because the more you learn about something, the more appreciation you get for it. Yeah. Um, but I think for right now, I'll give, I'll give you an answer. <laughs> um, I think right now, um, a really cool dinosaur, I think is just weird and fascinating. It's called Therizinosaurus. And it's part of this group of dinosaurs that um, is related to T-Rex and raptors. So these two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs, but this thing probably ate plants. So that just makes it weird. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, it's got these three foot long sickle claws, kind of like Wolverine from X-Men. Yeah. And it's just so weird. It's got these huge claws and very long neck. And right now that's my favorite. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I will have to look up a picture of that because it sounds really cool and really weird. And <laughs> it's right up my alley for sure. Um, so, for someone who would like to learn more about paleontology, do you have any resources that you can recommend? Sure. Um, for the pandemic being as it is, I highly encourage you, you know, read your books. Um, you can find some really good ones off of Amazon, like um, Fossils for Kids by Ashley Hall is a great um, book. Also, if you can go on YouTube and search up PBS Eons, that is a fantastic way to learn new and relevant paleontology facts. They're about 10, 15 minutes long each, and they're super engaging. They have real scientists. And then when the pandemic is over, I think the best way somebody can get into paleontology is to volunteer. Um, that's how I got into it. And it is really beneficial to the museum and for yourself. And through that, hopefully you will gain a mentor, which can, they can help you uh, through just pretty much your life and your career path. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, my very last question, and you've, you've already given some really great advice, but is what advice would you give to young women and girls who may be interested in pursuing a career in the STEM field? Sure, again, I'm gonna say the failure, this pressure to be great at everything. We have the stigma that if you're not a straight A student, you're not cut out to do science um, and that's, definitely not the case. I think if you have a passion and you absolutely learn from it um, and you keep trying that you can get there. You can, you can really get there if you keep trying and you build the right connections and you know the right people. Um, so that's why I highly encourage finding a mentor. And something that I did when I was younger, if you have questions about paleontology or if you have questions about getting into the field, cold email somebody, cold email a professor, cold mm -hmm. email a curator, um, you know, the worst they can do is ignore it, you know, and you just keep emailing the next person. And it'll really set you apart and you can gain a connection through that and potentially a mentor. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Yeah, and a lot of people in their field like to talk to others about their field, especially kids or teenagers. So yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us today. And um, it's been great getting to see the lab where you work. Um, thank you all for watching and thank you to the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas. Thanks for having me.